this dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small with time and space here a single thought is as 10000 years not here not there but everywhere always right before your eyes infinitely large and infinitely small no difference for definitions are irrelevant and no boundaries can be discerned so likewise with existence and non existence Sozan says so in sense in me the words are simple the mark of a resolved mind is that it puts forward everything in the most uncomplicated way that is what happens at the end of the speaker he says it's neither big nor small he says it's nothing to do with time and space he says it's neither here nor there and because the words are simple they cause no alarm within us they do not really compel us to be more careful our conditioning is such that only when a problem comes in front of us do we open our eyes only when something that appears to require effort challenges us do we wake up from our half slumber saints do not do that they have no intentions of complicating things they put things forward as they see them and they see them quite simply quite clearly the result is that we are let into a false sense of understanding just because it is not complicated we feel we understand just because the words are from everyday parlance we treat them casually yes of course all that sozan is saying is not here not there obviously what's the big deal anybody can say that not here not there not in time and space hm not to be touched by thought 
neither big nor small. Hmm? Neither is the sentence formation convoluted, nor are the words such that you will have to refer a dictionary or a thesaurus. Even a semi-literate person can claim to comprehend them. So we take in these words without waking up to the immensity they come from and very easily co-opt them. Very easily we accord to ourselves the right to say that we know what the speaker is saying. You would have surely come across hundreds if not thousands of people who have read the Upanishads, who recite the Bhagavad Gita daily, who have laid their hands on Ashtavakta. on Lao Tzu, on Jesus, and they say, yes, we know them, we have read those scriptures. Upanishads, did you say, yes, of course, after all, how long does it take to read an Upanishad? Some of them contain 50 aphorisms, some go to 150 and that's all. If you read them just as you read your regular fiction, you can polish them off in the course of one dreamy night. Your eyes heavy with slumber, your mind already lapsing into unconsciousness, you can still go through an Upanishad, read right till the last word, then comfortably close the few pages. and swell up in the belief that you have now mastered another scripture. Probably that enables us to have a more sound sleep. Yes, I have read. Irony of the situation is, the more accomplished the writer or the speaker would be, the more smoothly he would put forward what he has known. The more he has been able to dissolve himself the more he would have seen the solution to all the so-called problems that befuddle us. When nothing or very little remains a problem for him, it is unlikely that his words, utterances would be punctuated with problems. All you would find there 
is a simple, smooth, silent flow. And to a mind that is attracted only to noise, only to challenges, only to problems, only to obstacles, a smooth, quiet flow is not something valuable at all. Let me just elucidate it. Look over the week just gone by. What really do you remember from this week? Do you remember stuff that didn't cause you problems? Do you remember all that which was smooth? Do you remember all that which happened without obstruction, without effort, like your daily breath? Or do you specifically remember the things that hurt you, that drained you? That you wanted to happen but did not? What do you remember? Yes, please. Do you remember the glass of water that you just picked up, emptied and kept back? Do you remember all the steps that you just took or do you remember that one particular step that led to the stumble. Hmm? What do you remember? Do you ever prepare a list of everything that is right with your life? Or do you prepare a to-do list of everything that is vexing you? that is challenging you and troubling you. We are trained to value only the complicated, only the problematic. And that compounds the irony that I am talking of. The real saint would never come up with problematic statements. He the Terence says would be as simple as Tattvam Asi. That you are. Now there is nothing challenging in this. Somebody comes up and says, You are that. Now why does this trouble you? It cannot, it must not. You, yes. You came up to me and you said, You are that. I'll say, Yes, I am that. Game over. You go your way and let me remain mired in my usual routine. You are that and I am that and you are that and you are that. Somebody even with an elementary knowledge of any language can possibly in his own mind comprehend what is being said. 
Hmm? You are that. And hence, we are misled. The question is, is the saint misleading us by putting his words forward in a language that is unlikely to shake us up because only problems shake us up. And the saint does not come up with problem statements. So is he deliberately misleading us? No, he is not. He is helpless. Now he can only do what his inner simplicity commands him to do. He is innocent. His fundamental innocence is his master now. Even if he wants to, he cannot act complicated. will have to put things as he sees them and he sees them with clarity, with resolution, without ambiguity, without haziness. So much about the point these words are coming from and these words are absolutely simple. This dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small, with time and space. Here is a single, here a single thought is as 10,000 years. Not here, not there, but everywhere, always right before your eyes. Infinitely large and infinitely small, no difference, for definitions are irrelevant and no boundaries can be discerned. So likewise with existence and non-existence straightforward. Hmm? Now about the end they are being received at. When we receive these words, we receive them as we are. And when we receive them as we are, then their innate simplicity becomes valuelessness to us. Then their method of negation becomes barrenness to us. When the saint says, not here, not there, he says it with a wonderful delight. But when we receive these words, to us, these words are anti-life. To us, these words represent morbidity. Neither here nor there, then where? It's like boarding a bus and the conductor telling you neither here nor there. That implies you have to stand through the journey. Not pleasant at all. Because these are the only occasions when we tend to hear these words, neither here nor there. I cannot find my Gulu. Where is he? And your neighbor tells you, neither here nor there. Now that finishes you off. You are not particularly fond of these words. Are you? Where do I find my favorite pink bananas? And the shopkeeper tells you, neither here nor there. That will not particularly cheer you up, or would it? You 
Yes? We receive these words as we are. And receiving these words as we are, we remain so blind that we include them in our existing repository of knowledge. We sit over these words, we become their masters. We say that I knew about what is going on in my community. I knew what is going on in the stock exchange. I knew what is going on in the neighboring market. Now I also know what Suzanne is saying in Sin Sin Ming. Knowledge is knowledge. All knowledge exists in the same dimension. The moment these words become knowledge to us, they are integrated in the existing structure of our patterns. There is nothing called inferior knowledge or superior knowledge. There is nothing called divine knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge. You eavesdrop on two people gossiping at the railway station and you eavesdrop on a Krishna instructing an Arjun. In both these situations what you have received is just words being said by one man to the other not to you and to you both of these are just information, knowledge and they will necessarily be in the same dimension, in the same plane. This has been happening since forever. The saints have gone on saying and the readers have gone on continuing as they are. Nobody has been as misunderstood, as badly misunderstood as a Buddha, as a Krishna, as a Dhaktatreya as a Kabir. The saint cannot help it because he is a saint and we cannot help it because we are what we are. It is an impossible situation. He speaks from his heights, we receive from our depths. He cannot change what he says. And we cannot change the way we hear. So words, instead of giving clarity, become a source of further misunderstanding. The ego was already too fond of itself. Now it starts respecting itself. It becomes a spiritually respectable ego. I am someone who knows the scriptures. This is the usual contribution of a Buddha or a Krishna to our life. They bejewel our ego. They help us apply a little more respectability to our ego. What to do then? What to do then?
the saint does not speak the wise one does not speak so that you may be entertained he has no interest in providing you with fancy stories about the origin of the universe about theories of existence and non existence about stuff that you can boast off to your friends he has no interest in loading our minds with more information information anyways a workers so why does he speak why does he say something because at our end whenever is some whenever something is said to us we add it to our pre-existing database why then does the saint speak at all have we not already heard enough are our lives not already too full of words are there already not enough books in the libraries and bookstores so why does the wise one add another book to that great load on our collective consciousness that is called literature why does he speak he wants us to be readers he wants us to have fine taste in language he wants us to develop an advanced literary sense what is his intention he wants to earn some royalty out of writing the shrimad bhagavad gita he wants to propound a system of belief he wants to start a religion he likes to see his name up there along with the list of revered and published authors why does he speak at all he wants to contribute his books to the philosophy departments of universities why does he speak he wants us to be able to while away a lazy sunday afternoon if i won't speak won't people die of boredom so i want to give them a means to somehow escape away from the boredom of languid hot afternoons why does he speak why does he say anything why are these books published please and if we do not know why he speaks 
then why are you listening to me at all? Why am I speaking? Why does Lao Tzu, Susan, speak? In some sense, the question is absurd because the question assumes that he has an option to not to speak. As we said earlier, he is helpless about speaking. He would speak necessarily. But still, standing where we are, we who are fond of speculating about everything, we must say, why does he speak? Why? Ask that why? So the first thing came to my mind is why river is flowing? Why earth is moving on its axis? Why sun is rising? Why sun is setting? It's all about the flow of nature. That is what he yeah, can yeah. say that. That is what he can say at his end. I do not know why I speak. I am like the river, I do not know why I flow. But as far as our lives are concerned, do we see anything as reasonless? Is there anything to, we, to which we ever fail to ascribe a reason? So let's not borrow the words of the saints, they are not ours. Whenever we look at anything or anybody, we look with intention to discern intention, don't we? Has it ever happened that you have heard a knock at your door and you opened the door and just smiled at the visitor. Don't you immediately ask him, yes sir, so what do you want? Have you ever kept space for the allowance that he might just be flowing like the river? And just as the river flows and keeps on reaching many places, many cities, many people, he too, in his flow, has just come to your door. Do you ever ask the river, Ma'am, why have you now reached Prayag? Last time I met you at Haridwar. Do you ever ask the river? You don't. But whenever you meet someone at your door, you necessarily feel that he has an intention and a motive, don't you? And you ask him, why have you come to this place at this time, don't you? So let's talk real. We aren't people who can easily believe that someone or anyone can do anything without a motive. Had it been in our powers, we would have tried to speculate even the motive of a falling leaf. We would have even tried to speculate the motive of a floating cloud. It is next to impossible for us to believe that anything or anybody can work without motive, without 
intention without expectation of a result so tell me please from your own respective positions why does a saint speak How many times do you say I don't know in your life just because you are sitting in a gathering that has been in advance labeled as spiritual do not try to borrow a spiritual vocabulary in your daily life how many times do you so easily surrender and say I don't know in your usual living you either know a lot or you try to know a lot or you pretend that you know a lot why does the saint speak Why does the saint speak? Probably few of us can understand. Are you one of those few? If you are, then you understand. If you are not, then how can you speculate? You are saying that when you come here, it's a different thing, right? All throughout the week, you are engaged in one kind of living with one kind of mind. And you are talking about this place and these few hours as home. So you are certainly saying that there is a difference between this environment. and the one that you live in in the rest of the week hmm the answer to the question why does the saint speak is as simple as the saint the saint speaks so that you may listen Now is that not the most obvious answer? But it doesn't occur so obviously to us. He speaks so that we may listen. One feels like closing the chapter here. Yes, understood why he speaks. But there is a little more to it. To listen to the saint. you will need to have something of the saint to fully listen to the saint you will have to be the saint himself can the 
words of the awakened one be understood by the ones who are sleeping i see you quickly nodding your heads in negation i see that it is very obvious to you that the one who is in one particular state of consciousness the waking state will fail in his attempts to communicate with the one who is in a totally different state of consciousness the sleeping state yes you see that obviously right similarly the words being muttered by a sleeping person in his dream would fail to make sense to a person who is sleeping next to him they would even fail to make sense to a person who is awake and these are just different states of consciousness when you are waking you have different moods when you are sleeping then you have different dreams no dream can communicate with another dream or can it you are dreaming and a person lying next to you too is dreaming and both of you are dreaming your own worlds your own dreams can the two of you communicate with each other both of you might be uttering something in your dreams would that make sense to the other person it won't even reach the other person he is confined in his own world in his own dream now that makes it interesting all of these are states of consciousness and one is still conscious it is just that the states are varying just the variance in state can spoil and hinder communication so much you say something from one quality of mind and someone hears you from another quality of mind and there can be very little communication and mind you this is when both of them are still speaking from consciousness from mental activity the saint is not speaking from consciousness at all his words are not coming from mental activity at all they are coming from a sleepy silent relaxed awareness the different states of consciousness are like different points within this hall you are angry you are here you are excited you are there you are depressed you are there you are asleep you are there communication is not possible even within the different states of consciousness it gets distorted when all states are within the same big room called the room of consciousness even within this room communication cannot happen if there are different moods and different states and the saint well he is not within this room at all he is somewhere else now tell me can there be any communication at all please tell me a man angry cannot communicate to a man afraid so both of them are just wallowing in mental activity are they not 
both of them are within this room a man cannot communicate properly to a woman because she has the woman's consciousness and he has the man's consciousness and both of them are quite close still because both of them are within this room even when they are within this room yet they cannot really connect to each other because there is separation now tell me remaining within this room remaining within this room remaining within this room will you be able to connect to someone who is not within this room would that be possible yes we said the saint speaks so that we may listen we dwelled upon the question why does the saint speak and then we said he speaks so that we may listen the answer is straightforward now we are saying that we cannot listen because we are in this room and the saint is there we cannot listen because we are within this room this room called mental activity this room called mind this room called the confines of consciousness and where is the saint he is somewhere up there in the skies when can listening when can real communication happen please it can happen only in two ways either we drag him down to the point where we are standing or we fly up to the point where he is flying we are people of the prison what are we likely to do we were born in a prison we identify with the prison and we have committed ourselves to remaining in decorated prisons someone is speaking from there even if we have the intention of understanding him or even comprehending him what are we likely to do we are wedded to our prisons what are we likely to do would we break away our from our prisons and fly up to him would we do that or would we rather pull him down to our level what are we likely to do what are we likely to do drag him down so i'll remain where i am and remaining where i am using my own vocabulary my own methods of decoding a sentence i'll make sense of what he is saying now that cannot happen you will never be able to make sense of what the saint is saying the saint is still saying so what does he then want obviously what he wants has been neatly summed up in a few words he wants you to listen but behind his simplicity now we are saying probably lies a very vicious intention behind his child like demeanor lies an intention that is quite harmful to us what does he want what does he want he is saying i want you to listen to me but we are seeing that we are people of the cage and he is a bird of the sky and to talk to him we'll have to either fly or drag him down into the cage and he is saying but we must talk he is saying we must talk so what is he really saying he is saying okay if you can pull me down and if you can't then come fly with me what is he saying there is he leaving you with an option he is challenging you he is saying if you think that you can pull me down do that but play fair you cannot pretend that you have pulled me down you have to really pull me down 
and if you feel in pulling me down then you must surrender give up your prison let go of your bondage and come and join me up there in the skies most of us do not play fair most of us do not go by the rules we refuse to fly up and we also refuse to admit that we have been unable to drag him down what do we do we pretend that we have dragged him down we pretend all that the saint can say is ah cheating this is unfair do you want to play fair yes hmm some sportsman spirit yes you really think you'll be able to reduce a krishna or a buddha down into the cage you look at their life you look at their words you really think that they can be zipped into a 4 by 4 room hmm so that option is ruled out you really cannot bring them down here and the saint is saying i am speaking so that you listen to me now how do you listen to him then he is not asking you to read his words he is asking you to fly because unless you fly to the very skies he comes from you will anyway not be able to understand what he is saying i repeat the sleeping man can never comprehend the words of the awakened one it doesn't matter how pleasant the sleep is it doesn't matter how knowledgeable the dream is so these are not words these are invitations he is not asking you to comprehend him he is asking you to fly along with him and you know what it means to fly along with him it's a total and radical transformation of life unless you are living the life the saint lived you will never understand the words the saint utters i repeat it is not about his words it is about his life how can the caged bird ever really delight in the song of the soaring bird these words mean very little what does aham brahmasmi mean to you what does it mean i am brahm now what does that mean words do not matter life matters your flight matters are you flying i repeat only if you are living a life as free as that of the saint will you ever be able to capture the essence of the words of the saint otherwise you can just keep to yourself otherwise you can just proudly keep believing that you know the scriptures everybody is entitled to his own fancies he wants you to listen to him and the condition for listening to him is that you live from the same center from where he lived i repeat this and i know this disappoints a lot of us it may also even anger a few of us unless you are living like sozan you can never ever comprehend a single word 
of sense in me unless you are living like krishna you can never ever comprehend a single word of the gita and i am saying this with double treble quadruple emphasis i can never over emphasize on this we take these books as reading material we dub them as spiritual literature we treat our sunday gatherings as a part of our weekly portfolio it cannot help unless you have lived your entire week rightly the weekend reading session cannot bring to you anything new you can call the sunday mornings as just the topmost flowering of the tree that is your life there is an entire tree and at the top of the tree is blossoming a flower on the seventh day on the first six days the tree grows the tree takes a form and on the seventh day the bud opens the flower blossoms now can the quality of the flower be any different from the quality of the leaves and the twigs and the stem come on please how many times have you seen a tree which is totally diseased but but laden with beautiful flowers but that's our expectation right and how many times have you seen leaves and twigs beautiful coming from rotten roots how many times have you seen that for the flower to be beautiful the branch will have to be healthy the leaves will need to be shiny green the stem will need to be powerful and for the leaves and the branches to be this way will have to be stayed fastly anchored to the roots to really comprehend anything on the seventh day you must have lived a life full of comprehension on the first 6 days is that not obvious but don't we wish and expect just the opposite we say because my 6 days have not really been what they should have been so let me compensate by attending these sessions on the 7th day because i am engrossed in a job that gives me no spiritual space because my friends my family my relationships offer me nothing that has depth that has peace hence let me go go and make up for the deficiency on the 7th day we are using the words of the saint as some kind of a mineral or vitamin supplement so many of us anyway use them don't we because our regular diet is not proper hence we say that we need supplements or stimulants
Will that help? Will that help? I repeat, the words are absolutely straightforward. So there is no way you can even force yourself to conclude that there is something mystical or transcendental about them. You'll be very easily led into believing that you know. So forget the words. Just forget the words. Look at your life. How is life? Yes, sir. How is life? Suzanne says, the way, the truth has nothing to do with time and space. Tell me how is life? Tell me is there anything in your life that has anything to do with anything that has nothing to do with time and space? Look at all that our minds are mired in. Anything that is not in time and space? What is our consciousness? Our thought full of. Tell me one thing that matters to you and is not in time and space. Come on, please. Hmm? And we are going to be honest with each other. Tell me of one thing that matters to you. I mean, Can you see that everything, perfectly everything that matters to you is always in? Time is always in? Time, space. Time and space. And here, with a disarming innocence, the fellow is saying, this dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small with time and space. And we say, yeah, yeah. This dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small, with time and space. He has just struck a dagger in our heart and the skill of the fellow is he hasn't even let us know that we have been stabbed. He is doing it with such quite sneakiness that we don't even come to know that he has made a fool of us. With childlike simplicity, he has robbed us of everything without even letting us know. He is saying, this dharma truth, neither big nor small, not in time, not in space. But here we look at our lives and what do we find? Everything is in space. time and space. So what is he saying? He is saying truth is neither in time nor in space. And we are seeing that in our lives everything is in time and space. So what is the fellow saying? You know what is he saying? He is charging us of living a false life. And we don't even know. The rascal has just humiliated us. That's the thing about the masters. You won't even come to know how they have stolen your heart away. A normal thief would only take away your belongings. These are dacoits, the saints. 
the wise men, the prophets. They are dacoits in the true sense of the word. They just do not take away your belongings. They take away your very heart. And you can't even launch a police complaint. Someone comes and tells you, no sir, you know what? You have been engaging in falsehood. And you get angry at him. And this fellow is coming and saying that, no, no, it's not that you have been engaging in falsehood on one particular occasion. Your very life is false. You do not exist. You are not. And you can't even get angry at him. Instead, you have to go and respect him. You have to so, show some deference. A fellow says, you have been lying. And you slap him. And this fellow says, your very life is a lie. And you go and worship him. Do you see how smart he is? That's how masterly cunning the saints are. He says, this dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small. <clears throat> now tell me, sirs, what is it in your life that is neither big nor small? Anything that lacks dimension, anything that lacks measurability, anything that cannot be quantified, anything that cannot be labeled as big or small, even kids, you ask them, Golu, how much do you love mama? And when Golu says this much, Mama gets disappointed. Mama wants the love to be big. The formally anointed official day of loving just went by. And what were you supposed to do on that day? Demonstrate that your love is big. Be it love or love making. We want stuff that is big. Right? Anything that is alright with us without having measurability. We must measure the inches. Or the miles, or the units, or the square feet, or the height. And he is saying this dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small. Well, there are some who like big, and then there are some who have little alternate tastes. They like small. But neither big nor small, what are you asking us? To be renunciates? Yes, Alok, how do you like it? Big or small? You cannot say neither. Come on. <laughs> Abhishek, how do you like it? Big or small? Shobit would say, sir, anything. <laughs> <laughs> Beggars cannot be choosers. <laughs> and he is saying, this dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small. You still want to continue with this man? He is not here to save us. He is here to kill us, rob us. He will take everything away if you stay with him. The big having gone, you are left with not even the small. That is the thing about duality. When the big goes away, the small too disappears.
this therma truth has nothing to do with big or small, with time and space. In our life, everything is in time and space. Everything that is small is trying to be big. Everything that is big is threatening to become small. Look at the fellow. He hasn't even had the courtesy to warn us that he is leading us into disappearance. Now how do you listen to the words of such a man? How? With the kind of life that we live, obsessed with bigness, terrified of smallness, tied to objects of all kind, wandering in time, sauntering in space, what can these words possibly mean to us? We first need to have some taste of timelessness. We first need to have something that cannot be quantified, something that is so small that it cannot be touched or seen or measured and so large that its immensity forbids us from measurement. Do we have that? Do we have that? And if we don't have that, why are we wasting our time with this? Love, they say, is something beyond numbers, beyond measurement. But tell me please, how many of us know object-free love? How many of us know a love that is not captive to images? Tell me, the moment I say love, don't a few images start floating in front of your eyes? Is your loved one not a person to you? Is he not a man or woman to you? Is he not a body? Is he not an image? So even the greatest possibility of having something immeasurable has been squandered away. To measure is to set limits. All measurement has greatly to do with limits. Is there anything that is limitless in our life? Is there anything that won't go away? Come what may? Is there anything in our life that is always off limits? Is there anything that is unconditional in our life? Anything that won't be affected by the changing seasons? Please, 
and if there is nothing like that then why is the crow trying to fly with the swan why what are we doing in the company of sozan why and what In India, they say, "Kaga chale hans ki char." It's a satire upon the crow. The crow is trying to fly with the swan. He won't be able to match him. He would only end up making a joke of himself. What are we doing in this man's company? he is not even setting a prelude he is not even leading us gently still dilly and immediately without even giving us the time to be prepared he is delivering a blow this dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small with time and space in one blow he has declared all of us to be worshippers of falseness because if dharma truth has nothing to do with big or small with time and space then none of us have anything to do with the dharma truth because we are living in limits in measurement in big in small in past in future in objects in images with one mighty sweep of his hand he has dismissed away our lives as non existent you want to continue with him hmm? if you want to continue with him you have to continue without the big and the small without time and space You prepare to let go of all these. That's what he is asking. That's what the saint's intention is. The saint wants nothing less than saintness out of you. Who says that these are renouncers? Who says that these are people who have left the world? I see them as the most ambitious people. when it comes to transformation they won't settle for anything less than total and permanent change they don't compromise they don't agree with adjustments he is not saying this dharma truth has very little to do with big or small what does he say nothing. this dharma truth has nothing. nothing do you see the touch of the absolute he won't talk the language of the world where there are always limits and boundaries where there are always compromises he won't say sir it depends on you you see there are three or four possibilities he won't negotiate he won't say well if not 100% let's settle for 70% it's either 100% with him or nothing at all i prepared to absolutely be with him either you are absolutely with him or you are not gone is the big gone is the small gone is space gone is time where are you now gone with all of these the saint has murderous intentions 
the prophets of this world really have blood on their hands. No wonder the world often decides to execute them for this reason. The only difference is that the world kills in a gross way. All that it can execute and annihilate is the body. The saints kill you in the most fine manner possible. Your body keeps moving. But that which you called as life goes out of the body. Your body now becomes a vehicle of some other life. A life that is total, absolute and perfect. Saints are murderers of the highest order. Are you prepared to be slaughtered? You wish your silence to be taken in acknowledgement? Yes. Even a petty shopkeeper does not do that. Yes. Standing where we are, silence is only a mark of indecision. When the Malvi would ask you, Kabul hai, would you remain silent? <laughs> would you? Then why are you silent when the Divine is asking for your hand? Hmm? There you would utter with this mortal mouth itself, yes, I agree. Here you want to act spiritual. Here you want to use your ambiguous silence as a mark of acceptance. No, no, no. This is not the silence of the saint. This is the silence of the shrewd businessman who wants to remain silent because he doesn't want to open his cards. Hmm? The saint would have none of this. He stands in front of you, naked, innocent, and inviting like a baby. You cannot remain clad in front of him in all your cleverness. To be with him, to play with him, you'll have to be as naked as he is. Otherwise, you cannot understand him. Do you see why the saints, in spite of all their wisdom, have been the worst failures? In fact, nobody has ever failed so abysmally in what he is doing as the saints have. Because he lives a paradox. In spite of operating from an absolute fullness within, the success of his life work depends on whether or not you acquiesce on one hand it doesn't matter to him what happens to his life because he is already there he is already home he has nothing left to achieve on the other hand his life mission depends not on him but on you 
unless you agree to fly away from your cages you cannot understand him for that you have to nod your head for that you have to come up with an unambiguous yes so the saints are pretty helpless and more often than not the yes does not come forth so the saints fail and the saints i repeat have failed more badly than anybody else kabirs have come and gone nanaks have come and gone buddhas have come and gone we have remained what we are they keep coming and going we continue it is the opposite of what is usually said in the scriptures it is said that the truth is eternal the experience has been that stupidity is eternal truth keeps coming and going we get intermittent streaks of truth like shooting stars in the night sky what remains all pervasive and permanent is the pitch dark night saints come like shooting stars for a few seconds they illuminate the sky and then they are gone and then the world continues in its old ways the darkness remains krishna so helplessly one feels for the poor fellow man commiserates with him yada yada hi dharma se glanit bhavati bharat every time dharma is defeated krishna says he is compelled to come do you know what he is admitting dharma is defeated quite often and every time he comes he goes back without completing his mission because had he completed his mission and really defeated the evil why would he need to come back again but he says yada yada again and again whenever then to save the world i have to come again then to save the religion i have to come again and he goes on to say to save the righteous people the sadhus paritranaya sadhu naam even the sadhus here need to be saved they are such feeble and fragile fellows the buddhas have kept on failing because we have kept on defending ourselves with our nebulous silences silences that an optimistic mind would take as a mark of the same success but a realist would know it as just a ploy to defend oneself a buddha comes he speaks and the audience remains silent it is easy to wishfully imagine that the audience is one with the buddha no the audience is not one with the buddha the audience has just secured its words and thoughts beneath a sheet of silence silence is being used as an armor as a sheath to secure all that which is within the mind because if that which is in the mind is exposed then it runs the risk of being obliterated so we use silence as a sheath this sheath is what has defeated jesus the krishnas and the buddhas
Do you see this? Our silence is not the silence of truth. Our silence is never the silence of innocence. Our silence is not the classical mon. Our silence is rather a conspiracy. One has to come up with a thundering yes. And unless that yes thunders through your life, you will not be set free. You will remain the people of the cage. You cannot whisper a yes. You cannot mumble a yes. You cannot be double-minded on this. You cannot take time. You cannot plan it. You cannot say, I'll go and think it over. Here a single thought is as 10,000 years. Sitting where I am, I'm seeing thousands of these 10,000 years pass in front of me. Not here, not there, but everywhere, always right before your eyes. If you cannot see the truth everywhere and always, you will not be able to see it in a special session or in the saint's words either. If you are not living in it through the week, through the month, you won't be able to live in it for two confined and isolated hours. Such fragmentation cannot, cannot exist. Not here, not there, but everywhere, always right before your eyes. Truth. Either everywhere or nowhere. Either you live a life in truth, or you are not living at all. You get it, sir. Your attempts to isolate it, compartmentalize it, seclude it, limit it, locate it, situate it, mark it, define it. are all just attempts to secure your bondages. If you want to set limits to the truth, then don't you see what is it that you have kept off limits? If truth is in limits, then what lies outside those limits? Why must not 
entire life we lived in simple watchfulness why must you shy away from the facts why must we maintain a double speak why must we not call a spade a spade is there any end to the number of things people and situations that we have labeled wrongly in fact all labeling is wrong labeling those whom you call as your well wishers do they live up to their label do they look at all the troubles in your life are they coming from anybody other than those whom you have labeled as your well wishers come on please the troubles are not so much of a problem the labeling is when you know what is causing trouble to you why do you label it as something good for you why do you decorate your diseases why do you call stuff with misleading names who can save the bird that has started calling its cage its home when handcuffs become amulets and precious bangles then you are destined to remain handcuffed why can you name things rightly and it's easy look at a thing without the intention of naming it and you will come to the right name look at a thing without any pre existing inclination for a name and you will come to its right name look at a thing without having opinions about it and you will come to the fact look at yourself without having decided who you are and you will come to know who you are look at your life your work your relationships your movements your interactions your dealings your objects your possessions your desires your plans look at them as you would impersonally impartially look at somebody else's life and you will know the right name for everything that you are that may appear threatening at this point but it is the finest affirmation of your life
when it happens it is the most beautiful flowering of love of intelligence the saint pleads in front of you he says please let me finish you off saint is really a beggar with folded hands he stands in front of you and begs he says please give away all your sufferings all your torment all this rubbish that you have been carrying you don't give it away you don't give it away because you have identified with it because you fear that if you give it away you would actually be giving away a lot of yourself we have become so habituated to disease that freedom from disease appears so much like death it is not death do you really think that someone like susan is speaking from the grave is he a dead fellow to you yes in fact he is the only one alive the flying bird is an invitation the presence of the saint his radiance that far off place from where his words arise it is an invitation it is a reminder it tells you you too belong to that place it tells you you too own the sky you have the legacy of the wealthiest father possible you have inherited the entire world why are you living in utter poverty why have you forgotten your riches your father has left so much for you everything that he has is yours but we have become so attached to our begging bowl that we feel that if the begging bowl is taken away then we would die of starvation a popular word for god in india is hari it's the most apt depiction of the work of godliness the work of godliness is to take away harad taking away the one who takes away is hari the moment he we hear that the act of godliness is to take away we start trembling even more what precious things that you have that you fear would be taken away what really are you so scared of losing what do you have worth preserving Yes the saint is here to rob you but what do you have worth securing 
if he will rob you he will only rob you of all that which you do not deserve to have he will only rob you of this unending strife this stress this indecision this confusion this depression let him rob you please he is begging let him rob you these words do not mean anything i repeat he has not written these so that you may read them and add them to your knowledge no it's a love letter and love letters are not meant to be substitutes of love it is an invitation as all love letters are he is inviting you come join him come fly with him in some sense realization is the biggest loneliness you see how easy it is you see how absurdly simple it is and then you also see how the teeming millions around you just don't get it and you shout and you shriek and you wave and you gesticulate you want them to see the obvious you want them to join you even in your absolute perfection and completeness it's no fun to play alone even if you know that diversity and otherness is a falseness the only way you see of showing it to be false is to have the others join in where you are so he begs the saint keeps pleading why don't you join him theoretically a buddha is total full and all complete within himself but compassionately he is very very lonely I don't you join him Why else would he walk from village to village right till the age of 78 80 Why else would a Krishna take pains to speak so much to an arjun to an unwilling arjun why else would jesus sacrifice his life why else would a krishna murti keep on speaking till the age of 91 they are living walking invitations
so many of the most profound instructions in wisdom have been delivered when the speaker is on the deathbed even in his last breath his love is still asking for your hand why don't you accept saint his work is twofold On one hand he is very very stubborn he is helpless he cannot come down to where you are even if he wants to so if your expectation is that he will climb down he cannot please have some empathy he can no more come to where you are it's beyond him he's gone past that stage when he could come and talk to you as you he is helpless he may even try but he would fail occasionally he does try and fails but just as he is helpless in not being able to come to you as you are he is equally stubborn equally persistent in not stopping in calling you again and again in fact he is helpless both ways he is helpless about not being come down to you and he is helpless about never ceasing to extend his hand to you he will keep calling he will keep calling he will keep calling it is not a reciprocal thing it is not a thing where you meet him midway you cannot say well i'll rise a little you fall a little it is a thing of the absolute you will have to absolutely climb up and only you will have to absolutely climb up he cannot come down any more i request show some understanding some empathy some compassion even some mercy would do he is doing the best he can being what he is he is speaking in your language he is leaving behind scriptures he is leaving behind words and books and stories all of these are calls invites he is already doing the best he can he can do no more really he lives among you in his lifetime he shares space with you he eats his food with you he spends his life with you what else and what more can he do if your expectation is that he must share his consciousness with you that he cannot do he is helpless his consciousness now operates from a totally different center is difficult to dislodge it from there but yet he does whatever he can he speaks in the simplest words possible 
He meets you. He roams from place to place. Kindly be a little considerate. Infinitely large and infinitely small, no difference for definitions are irrelevant. Be it infinitely large or infinitely small, both defeat us because both are marked with the infinite. Do we know anything infinite? Doesn't matter whether it is infinitely large or infinitely small. Do we know anything of the infinite? We are people of finiteness. We are people of definition. Can we work with anything that is not defined? To define something is to make it finite. The moment something is not clearly laid out in front of us, it makes us uncomfortable. We want things squarely laid out. We want stuff clearly marked out. We live in whites and blacks. We live in duality. cannot live in the infinite and when you cannot live in the infinite you suffer somebody just like Suzanne probably a cousin brother said Nal pe sukham. there is no joy in the little in the finite yo vai bhuma tat sukham only in the infinite is their delight. Only in the infinite. Do we have anything that we have not defined? Do we have anything that has been spared our little touch even when the very truth stands in front of you you define it in fact that is our bogey I was saying to Shubhankar the other evening When the truth stands in front of you, ninety-five out of hundred people fail to identify it because their eyes anyway do not see anything. So Krishna Buddha, the very personification of truth, can walk past you right in front of your eyes and you won't even notice. So 95 out of 100, 19 out of 20 people take no cognizance of the truth even as it is there all around. 5 out of 100 people do get an inkling that there is something special here. That this scripture or this man is special but then they are defeated all the more because when they come to know that this man is special they try to take him home they try to own him 
95 percent people would not recognize a Sozon when they come across him. The 5 percent who would recognize him would try to own him. Rare is the man who recognizes and surrenders. Rarest of rare. In fact, you are better off if you do not even recognize him. You are better off if such a meeting does not happen in your life. You are condemned if you meet a Jesus, a Sozan, and you say, wow, this man is special. And then you say, now let me own him. Now let me take him home. Now let me define him. Now let me cast him into a relationship. The fate of such attempts is worse than the fate of not identifying a Buddha at all. We try to define everything. To define something is to limit it, is to own it, is to become its master. We try to define even a Buddha, Krishna, a Sozan. And thus we kill all the possibility of the truth being able to redeem us because the finite cannot be redeemed by the finite. The finite can be saved only by the infinite. But when the finite decides to define the infinite, it has robbed the infinite of its capacity to redeem it. You disable the Buddha. You are the handicap that a Krishna carries. He stands right in front of you and you say, Ah, I know him. I have a definite relationship with him. And now, Krishna has been shorn of his powers to help you. He cannot help you anymore. He could have helped you only if you would have acknowledged that in front of me is standing something of the beyond. And if it is something of the beyond, it is infinite, it is not within your purview, you have no right to encircle it. If it is something of the beyond, then you are not entitled to have any expectations from it because the finite can expect only from the finite. From the infinite, there is no question of holding expectations because the infinite is beyond you. If it is beyond you, how are you going to predict it? And if you cannot predict, how are you going to set expectations? But we have expectations even from a Lao Tzu. We have, an, we have expectations even from Jesus and when he doesn't fulfill those expectations, we just don't like it. We project our own image of right and wrong even on the one who is beyond right and wrong. We project our own motives even on a Krishna. We look at the sky from our little windows, sometimes even from our keyholes. And unable to find the sun, we say, ah, the sky is just living on borrowed light. I have seen the sky and it is no bigger than my own keyhole. What does it mean to have something of the infinite in your life? It 
means that you would be both honest and humble about your finiteness. What is finite must be acknowledged as finite. Kindly do not try to name the limited as unlimited. To name the limited as unlimited is to insult the unlimited. When you know what something is, do not unnecessarily name it in a misleading way. You know what your affections are, you know what your love is, you know what your attachments are. Why do you then tell yourself that they are eternal? Why then you tell yourself that they are limitless? You know what all is conditional in your life. Why then do you think of it as eternal or unconditional? Why can't you honestly accept that all of this is limited? When you honestly accept the finite, the infinite has already been surrendered to that is called humility. And I talked of these. Honesty and humility, they go together. To honestly see the finite as finite is humility. Infinitely large and infinitely small, no difference, for definitions are irrelevant and no boundaries can be discerned. So likewise with existence and non-existence. Existence and non-existence are not opposites of each other. Just as life and death are not opposites of each other. When you look at the unit, when you look at the micro, when you look at the atom, you feel that existence pales or disappears into non-existence. But when you look at the macro, the compound, the total, then you see that even as the atomic keeps on disappearing and reappearing, the total remains what it is. Really, non-existence then is that which is beyond what we call as existence, what we call as life. The opposite of this life that we live is not death. The opposite of this life that we live is real life. And that real life appears like a great death because we have defined our existence with conflict, with stress, with tension. Real life is the absence of all these. Because real life is the absence of all these, when truth threatens to take these away, then we feel almost as if we are dying. Getting it? 
non existence is not a threatening word non existence can be read as non strife non suffering do not be afraid of it still a lot of silence only you know what it means Can the truth be overshadowed by unreal? For whom? Not for the truth, but for the unreal. Yes, it can live in the delusion that it has overshadowed the truth. You are asking the question as if there is an objective overshadowing. The overshadowing is our objective. It is always with respect to some subject. ask the truth have you been overshadowed it would just smile ask the false have you overshadowed truth it would grandly declare yes of course i have defeated the truth so from whose center are you asking so my question is like uh, can the master feel frustrated of course yes because he is a, he is home already how do you know you have read from the scriptures that he is home and you have an image about being at home what do you think being at home one does nothing being at home one is left with nothing being at home one is now vested with far greater responsibilities all that we know of is petty responsibilities and where there are infinite responsibilities there is also infinite frustration because you have the responsibility that you cannot unilaterally fulfill to fulfill these responsibilities you require the cooperation of the ones who are unwilling to be responsible it is not a project where you are dealing with objects even the ego has a certain freedom the ego has the freedom to surrender or not the ego has the freedom to say yes or to say no and no saint no realized master can take that freedom away from the ego krishna does not command arjun krishna keeps on appealing to arjun 18 chapters he takes and arjun has the freedom to keep saying no 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 again and again and krishna is trying all kinds of ways and methods and words to take arjun to something that is so straight forwards he is weaving circles to take arjun to a point that is intimately in front of him krishna is taking him along to a circuitous journey of seven worlds and seven fairy lands standing where we are 
the word frustration is very much applicable. Hmm? But frustration when it comes to a Krishna is called compassion. Do you know how frustrating compassion is? Do you know what compassion means? Compassion means when you are weeping in front of me, I parallelly know two things. One, that that which you are weeping for is false. So your tears mean nothing. Two, even if your tears mean nothing, even if that which you are weeping for is false, yet you are suffering. Do you see how impossible it is to be wedged between these two? On one hand, you know that your tears are false. Your entire suffering is imaginary. On the other hand, you also see that even if it is imaginary, you are indeed suffering. Compassion is this divine frustration. How to redeem someone? The fellow is convinced that his suffering is real. You tell him that your suffering itself is false. Then there is a disconnect. You tell him that his suffering is real, he becomes even more deeply entrenched in his suffering because even you have now certified that his suffering is real. So you cannot say that his suffering is false. If you say that his suffering is false, he will accuse you of heartlessness, of not empathizing. He will say, you just do not commiserate with me. You have no feeling for me. And if you tell him your suffering is real, then he will say, this is exactly what I too feel, that my suffering is real. And now that you have validated it, that allows me to wallow in my suffering a little more. Isn't it frustrating to be wedged like this? But the frustration of a Krishna is not like our frustration. Our frustration arises from the non-fulfillment of our desires. We get frustrated when we do not get something that we want for ourselves. A Krishna or Kabir does not really want it for himself. His frustration, that is why I am calling as a divine frustration of another quality, of another dimension. His frustration comes when you do not see that you do not need to suffer. In fact, only a Krishna can really and truly be frustrated. Our frustrations are so small and so unreal that they can be easily overshadowed. You are frustrated that you lost a thousand rupees. And then you come home and you discover that your son has failed the board exams. You forget your first frustration. What happened to it? It's gone. It was a petty frustration. It has been overshadowed by a bigger frustration. So we are not really frustrated. Only a Krishna is really frustrated. Only the saints have really cried. And they have cried so much that they have ended up laying down their lives.
it is a paradox when joy is sitting in the heart why is the saint crying that is the thing when joy is sitting in the heart it becomes even more difficult to reconcile that the world is in such a sorry state it becomes even more difficult to comprehend why the same joy is not available to everybody and it becomes an even more overpowering urge to share with others what you have like a kid who wants to share his toffee with his best pals like a cloud uh, unless it rains it will feel heavy it feels heavy about the cloud we do not know whether it is vested with such a consciousness but surely you have seen kids who are desperate to share their stuff surely you have been in love and you have known what it means to eat a little and share the rest <laughs>